Uh, welcome back. So this we are doing another uh, episode of the Fit Veteran Podcast today. I have uh, Matthew Weiss with me. He is an intelligence officer in um, the Marine Corps right now, um, and he has written a best-selling book that uh, basically talks about um, why Gen Z does not want to join the military anymore and what we need to do to fix it um, so we can you know, keep protecting our, our great country. So, um, welcome Matt. Great to have you. Um, anybody that's watching this guys, if you're watching it as always hashtag, um, replay in the comments, if you're watching it after the fact, if you're watching this live hashtag live in the comments. And then if you have any questions for Matt, um, regarding his book, the, um, the crisis we're facing right now with, uh, recruitment, um, or anything for me, as far as fitness related, or just anything, um, just comment in, um comment in the comments and uh we will get to them we will answer any questions after the fact so cool let's go ahead and get started do a quick little pause and we will um start the podcast so <clears throat> all right welcome back everybody to the fit veteran podcast today i have with me uh matt weiss uh matt is an intelligence officer in the united states marine corps um he's written a a pretty uh, well-known book. Um, it's called uh, We Don't Want You, Uncle Sam. Um, this examines the military recruitment crisis among um, Gen Z or Generation Z. Um, so welcome, Matt. I appreciate you coming today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to kind of hearing all about this crisis. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk about it and uh, answer any questions. Yes, sir. And uh, Matt is all the way in Australia. So for anybody listening, if you're hearing like a bit of a a lag in time um it's simply because he's so far away it's actually like 5 a.m in the morning over there it's about 4 p.m uh est over here so he's been uh gracious enough to get up in the morning with us um which i'm sure he's used to being in the marines um probably nothing to him so um cool matt well tell us about a little bit about your background um kind of like what got you interested in the recruiting process what you noticed with i mean your generation z so you obviously um know all about this topic and uh kind of like what got you in to the point where you wanted to write a book about it absolutely so um from background i, I joined i guess a little bit uh, later than the the usual officer i went to business school first um, worked in a pretty intense tech company. Um, and at both of those places, um, the recruiting problem was the opposite, right? Business school is super intense to get into. They have too many applicants. And at the tech company I worked at, it was a pretty cool cutting edge uh, defense technology company. They also had literally too many applicants, right? So I saw recruiting from that side, basically recruiting gone right. That That's a good problem to have where you have, uh, you post a spot and you actually have a lot of interest in it, right? Um, when I joined the military, I've only joined a year and a half ago, so I'm, I'm no expert. I fully admit that I have a lot to learn from my elders. Um, but I was recruited into the military successfully a, a year and a half ago. And I saw, you know, the flip side of that process. I saw this, um, crisis, frankly, this recruiting crisis talked about where, uh, people are simply not interested in joining today, right? There's, there's a lot of issues going on. And what really triggered me the moment, uh, to write the book, the trigger moment was, uh, to use that word in an in in interesting way, but basically I was watching the news um, and each news station, all the big ones were having these recruiting segments about, hey, the military is not meeting its goals. And I saw that everybody that they had on the panel was a really respected general or admiral or, you know, 20 year vet or something. And again, major respect to them, 100%. But they are so far removed from the days that they were recruited, right? Some 20, some 30 years away. There's no way they know what is on my younger brother, who's an 18 year old in high school, what's on his Instagram feed, right? And that thinking what's on the 18 year old high school Instagram feed, that's actually the person you're, you're selling this lifestyle to that you're actually trying to get connected to. So I felt compelled as a member of Gen Z. Gen Z is considered those who were born between 1998 and 2012. Uh, 1997 to 2012, as a member of that age group, as someone in that age group, I felt compelled to say, hey, here's my view, here's the Gen Z view, and let's come together with actual solutions, right? I'm not whining or complaining about problems. I'm saying, hey, this is what's happening. This is what people are thinking. 
that's come through with uh with some solutions basically for sure so what do you think the the major disconnect obviously there's the uh generational gaps between like the five star you know colonel and and the new recruit coming in what what are the major gaps between um you know recruiting nowadays versus like recruiting back in the day absolutely so it's a great question i could break it down in a few ways um there's three sort of buckets that that initially come to mind with this right there's the knowledge identity and trust bucket so we'll start with knowledge knowledge is simply knowing about military life right We've historically, right, World War II, everyone knew someone that served, right? And veteran during the draft years, population was much higher. For 50 years, we've had an all-volunteer force, right, from 1973 at the sort of the end of Vietnam to now. So the veteran population in the U.S. has substantially decreased, right? We've become a professional military. There's fewer people actually in uniform, um, which is, again, um, veterans and, and those that have served are even more valued now and more more valuable, right? But there's less people, not everyone has a brother or sister or father or someone that served, right? So there's not as much knowledge about what life in the military is in the general population. Um, in the trust gap, right, we've seen two long wars, 20 years of fighting. We've seen a lot of veterans mistreated by the government or the military, right? Um, a lot of come back with wounds, a lot of come back with PTSD. Um, that trust of uh, will the military take care of me? Will the military be good on its word of all the things that it promises while in uniform? That that's become an issue, right? And so Gen Z has a not a negative perception of the military, but the trust in the institution is lower than it's been. There's a Ronald Reagan um, Institute of Defense poll that sort of polls, you know, one of these big mega polls. And it asks, you know, what are our views among institutions? The military still ranks the highest regarded institution in the U.S., uh, more than any other institution, more than Congress, right? more than other institutions, but it's lower in percentage of trust than it ever has been, right? So before, it was like 80% of Americans trust the military, right? Now it's around like 56, 57. It's still more than any other institution, but overall trust has come down. So that's an issue. And the last one is the is this identity gap. And this identity gap with Gen Z is can they see themselves as someone in uniform, right? We like to say, or I've heard a good quote, you know, the military is made up of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, right? Um, but with various movies, and we could talk about this in, in a few ways, but with various movies, various uh, lifestyle uh, depictions of the military, just various um events that have occurred in the past 20 years, it's, it's harder and harder for a Gen Zer on Instagram and, and TikTok at 18 to picture themselves as having a life in uniform, to understand uh, what that actually means. What are they actually doing every day, you know? Because um, frankly, and this is one of my, my, my big points, not everyone is going to be the future Navy SEAL special ops person, right? And so what about the average regular American who says, I want to join, but I don't think I could do that. Maybe the military isn't for me. And I think that's a big marketing message that, that, that we're missing. Um, and we're struggling with that identification with the actual generation. Okay, I got it. So so the last one really made sense to me. Um, just like the you know, Gen Z population not being able to see themselves in um in the military or or serving that side. And before I go forward, I said uh five star colonel earlier i meant five star general yeah. before anybody jumps down my throat about that i know i'll be uh getting some shit for that but anyways um so you think that it's the marketing issue on on that end where it's like it's showing like the blue raw like let's go get the bad guys and jump out of helicopters and you know diving in the ocean but it's not showing like maybe the logistical side the admin side the things that people could do where it's like hey i ain't trying to go like shoot at people or get shot at I just kind of want to set myself up for a good future. You feel like that side just not getting marketed to enough. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. So, so one of my theories, right, is, is for, first off, the military should not to solve this crisis ever low standards. Like that, that can't be the solution. There's two things that cannot be the solution to this. We can't just say more money because frankly, the country doesn't have more money to give, right? You can't just say, you know, spend more money on the military and, you know, fix everything. That's not going to be a solution. And the second one is you can't, 
compromise standards. We can never compromise the ability, the efficacy, or the professionalism of our armed forces. That's not the way to go, right? We want to be the best. We want to keep the best. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we attract those that aren't joining who are probably still pretty good performers to join? And one of my theories is the following, is that there's always going to be a, a strong enough cadre in the country of young men and women who want to go be grunts in the infantry, aspire to be special forces, the really tough, what you would think of as classic warfighter warriors. They exist. They're going to always naturally exist. They're going to be drawn to military lifestyle. They're going to be drawn to being a door kicker. They, like the, That is awesome and that is key. And, and we need those people and they are always going to be the main effort. Nothing against that. But we know combat ratios, there's a ten, usually a 10 to 1 support ratio, right? Where you're losing people and where you're struggling is someone that wants to go into sort of an ancillary job that is in uniform, is just as important, arguably, right? right? But is competing with Amazon or McDonald's for a job, right? If you can go and do supply, potentially, nothing of supply, but maybe you can do supply at Amazon or you can do it in the military, you're going to lose a lot of people to the benefits of Amazon, the lifestyle of Amazon versus going through this intense boot camp and putting on uniform. Again, I'm not saying they shouldn't be going through boot camp and putting on uniform and, and learning military way and potentially, you know, becoming uh, grunts themselves or, or having to participate in very hazardous, difficult situations. But we need to appeal to those people to say, hey, these jobs exist. There's great opportunities in the military. You get a much better, more cohesive lifestyle that I can talk about, you know, what's the actual value prop. And sort of marketing to them as well, not leaving them out, because frankly, that's the largest pool of the population that will join. Yeah, for sure. And so, like, how much? I'm just it's it's a little off topic, but like, how much of it do you think is because like so the big promise of the military, or at least one of the big promises, is this the free school, right? The free college education, and with college education in in my mind, and I think I I, I kind of see it in across the board. It's just like it's being very devalued. People just don't want to go into debt for it, um, and not only not only because obviously like the military part solves that problem if it's free, but it's just the diploma is not as valued as much as it used to be. So how much of that do you think plays into this recruiting crisis? It's a, it's a great question. I want to uh, start with the answer with, with one of my main points and then get to specifically the colleges. So one of my main points is like, look, my generation does not remember 9-11. We were either not born or we had no cog, you know, we were two years old. We had no cognitive remembrance, right? So that key military event that shaped a lot of, you know, millennials, older generations, uh, really a, the surge in patriotism that doesn't exist for us, frankly, right? Not that we're not patriotic, not that we don't love the country, I have a flag behind me, right? But I think my generation is much more okay with saying what's in it for me. What am I giving, but also what am I gaining? And, and that's not a bad question to be asking, right? I think some of the older, more senior ranks Look, look down on that, but I think that's actually the right question to ask in this very fast-moving 21st century world. So they have this problem with like, why are you why are you joining? I'm serving my country and being patriotic. Like, frankly, that's not the main driver for most people joining nowadays. It's just not true. It's a, it's a secondary driver. It exists in a lot of us very strongly, but there usually is more of like a what's in it for me primary first driver, right? I, I call it like an external factor rather than like an internal factor. And so with that, I think one of the shifts has to be in society and the marketing has to has to be, hey, like it is OK to say I am joining the military to better myself or I'm joining the military because I want to learn how to lead or I am joining the military to get a college degree. Like saying that, which is stigmatized still and is bad, should not be, you know, looked down upon. Like that is just as valid of a reason as someone who's saying I'm going to serve and protect my my family and my country. Right. And we have to celebrate and accept that that viewpoint right so the person who joins for the college degree for, for citizenship for something else like that is allowed and okay and we have to market that better now again you're absolutely right so with the value proposition of college being called into question right and sort of the gi bill that has been this great benefit um what is what is the new value proposition of the military if it's not that now a lot of people will still say obviously and i think there is still a huge value of having the college degree and being able to to get that from the military. So it's not everyone, but but a lot of people are looking at alternate pathways, trades that don't need colleges in the modern economy, like as, as those paths, right? And that's where I, I would argue some of the military skills that you would gain 
are hugely valuable compared to some private sector education or some private sector degree, right? You learn how to work in teams. You learn how to lead. Sometimes you learn very key trades, right? Think of all the motor T technicians. Like those are key trades that you could go a ton of technician courses for, or you learn right on the job in the military and find value in. Um, and to specifically answer your question and specifically talk about this reskilling, like the military is this great reskilling um, and upskilling, those are two words, like reskilling, teaching uh, new skills and upskilling, like bettering one's skills. It is this great uh, organization for that. It is this great program for that. It should be promoted as that to those that say, hey, I never, I don't want a college degree. I don't need it, but I'm going to learn a lot of skills. And I want to learn a lot of skills. So that's sort of a way to market the military in that vein, basically. Okay. I got you. And so, so I kind of was aware of this problem maybe like five or six years ago. I, I was, I think I was actually listening to another podcast and they were talking about a recruiting crisis, but this was millennials, not Gen Z yet. So it might've been further than five years ago. It might've been 10 years ago, but anyways, I remember one, one recruiter on there, I forgot what branch he was, but he was talking about how not as many kids are playing sports nowadays. So like, typically it was easier to find the kids that like to play sports. They would, you know, be gung ho about joining the military as well. Um, are you seeing that with Gen Z? Um, is that even like a, a real thing? Because obviously you don't have to be like super athletic to do some of these positions. Um, what have you been seeing on that end? So it's a, it's a great question. And I, I looked into sports specifically because sports very much, youth sports in the U.S. are 100% probably the best feeder into a potential military population or frankly for like a warrior team culture population, right? The, the benefits of athletics and and from, from a science and a psychology perspective uh, of team sports and, or any sports in the U.S. Are, are huge, right? All the journal articles I've studied, all of these are, are massive. I mean, no one will dispute that. And our youth sports program uh, in the country is just amazing for the country. It does, it does huge benefit for the country as a whole. So what we're seeing specifically in, in, in the data is there's still a high rate of participation and uh, initial joining of youth sports, we see a larger drop off come high school than in the past, right? So while and this is one of my arguments, so gym class, for example, has sort of been morphed into like a quasi health and PE uh, education type class, whereas in the past, it was pretty much, you know, an athletic program, right? And, we're, and that's one of the issues that we're sort of seeing as a society, right? Kids are starting in sports, they're doing soccer, basketball, baseball, football at a young age. But then we're actually seeing it drop in high school, whether that's just the stresses of modern American high school, you know, social media, uh, not enough programs for them. And that's where we're seeing the issue. It's the drop. Right. And that's one of the areas I think the military can either help fill the gap or society, because some of these things I talk about in the book are really societal. Right. The military is such a big organization. We're, we're dealing with a societal problem. We need to be able to to continue those athletic trends, whether that's making a gym, for example, more into this physical training uh, program or more into an ability to cycle people back into sports or, or get them excited about it. That That's a huge area gained, right? I, I don't know your, your uh, recollection of gym class or, or my high school, not disparaging it in any way. It was just a little bit different maybe than, hey, this is the way to exercise. It's the way to have good fitness. And this is you know, a way to continue sport, right? It was more of a, I remember there was a driver's ed course in it, and then there was a, fun, a bunch of health courses and it was sort of disorganized. We played badminton, nothing against badminton, but like, you know, we need that core team sport mentality that really will get people through um, and continue to have them keep playing, right? Because you're absolutely right, recruiters should be picking from sports and that's the best way to continue to get people excited about team uh, mindsets. Okay, and so... With that being said, like, do you feel like, how do you feel? And I don't even know if you could answer this question because you don't know what it was like maybe 15, 20 years ago, but maybe you've heard through the grapevine, like as far as like um, the health of our children these days, like coming out of high school, you know, are we more, well, obviously there's more obesity, but like, are these kids just in way worse shape? Are they actually like smarter with how they work out? Like, what if you can can you tell us like any differences between gen z um athletic not athletic ability but just general health versus like i don't know generation x or like uh the baby boomers or something like that 
Absolutely. It's a, it's a great question and, and, it, and it perfectly ties into one of the, uh, the, the book chapters. So I'll, I'll attack it in, in, in a good way. So basically, um, the short answer, the theory on this, or from what my findings on this, is that in the extremes, right? So like the super obese, the super diabetic, the super unhealthy, Gen Z is worse, right? Like there are problems there, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, th- those that have, if you could say, fallen off, you know, good health, have fallen off a lot harder in my generation than in others. And that that is a problem, right? So the extremes, the, the sort of five, 10% most extreme cases have gotten substantially worse and are substantially more, you know, dangerous, right? Much more obese, much more unhealthy, much, much worse. Um, and that's a problem that has to be looked at in itself. For the military specifically, though, right? The general population, one of my arguments and one of the theories is that the general fitness of the population isn't that much worse than it was necessarily 20 years or or even 50 years ago, right? Like the, the general uh, phenotypic body type, right? If anything, we're a little bit more health conscious. Alcohol usage and drug usage is actually down amongst mm-hmm. Gen Z, which is hard to believe. We could talk about um, drugs and, and marijuana is, a, is another point because that's an interesting part um, that people have been asking, but it's actually down. Uh, social media is up, so there's a, a huge mental health issue that we can go into in, in a second, but the actual physical fitness of the, the main the main uh, group of the generation isn't that much worse. And so this is one of my arguments. Frankly, it hasn't been that much different than you know, 60, 80 years ago uh, e- either, right? So one of my arguments is that the military has this really Byzantine or, or sort of old style um, MEPS process of like approvals and health waivers and stuff. And so it's this crazy stuff where like, if you you could be an all-star, freaking unbelievable high school varsity athlete, right? Literally like college scholarship bound potentially or just an unbelievable player, but you broke your arm in third grade. And now you need to go through this crazy process of running back to this doctor or that doctor to show like, oh, his arm in third grade was documented, broke, and he's fully healed. And that's just a crazy like thing to ask. Like, this person is extremely athletic, better than 99% of the population, but he has to go get this crazy waiver. Or on the other side, hey, he took Adderall for you know a year, you know, and, and it was prescribed, but he's struggling with school. And, you know, we have this big over prescription now of of um, study drugs or sort of mental health drugs, right? You need to get all that approved. Again, he's fully functioning. He's an unbelievable athlete, but now he needs to go through this crazy waiver process. It doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? Or he had a concussion. That, that's a huge one, like the, the un- unfound scar, right? Like he, he needs, but he never went to a doctor, so he can't document it. So there's this old style waiver process. Most of the waivers get approved anyway, but you turn kids off if you tell them, hey, you know, join us, join this job. And they go, okay, great, let's do it. And then they have to wait 90 days for some waiver process or some super long backlog. Like that, That's not exciting. They're going to say, screw that. I want to go get a job at Amazon and, and have a nice day. You know, and, and that's sort of this old, old style bureaucratic system that we need to really modernize basically to encourage them to join. So again, to specifically wrap up the question, Yes, Gen Z has much more problems on the peripheries, on the extremes. The actual main group is, is probably not any less physically fit overall um, than, than 20 years ago or really than 80 years ago. But specifically with related to recruitment, they need to be given a better point of sale, better easy process to say, hey, listen, you're a great athlete. I don't care that you broke your arm. You could have broken your leg. But look at what you're performing at, right? You're able to join sort of right now and run this lag, basically. And why do they make that so difficult, especially with like some of the things there's obvious things that it's like, well, that's a red flag, like you probably shouldn't be in the military. But then there's the things like you're you're talking about where it's like, dude broke his arm, you know, five years ago, like, um, because so obviously, it's for liability issues is what I would think right away. So is that people, you know, suing the government after their kid comes back from boot camp with a broken arm again, after they already had a broken arm? Or is it like, um, I really don't understand that because like if you're going into the military, you know your ass is probably gonna get messed up one way or the other. Like there's kind of no way about it. So like where is that coming from where it's such a like gated thing to like um especially in the recruitment crisis right now where it's like we're getting having a hard time getting anybody to come in and then we're we're stopping the good ones at the door. Like why do you think that is? Yeah, uh, you know, you, you bring up a good point about sort of, it, yes, there, there is a sense of the government, you know, VA claims, right? The, uh, I talk about in the book a little bit, like, hey, 
Um, you don't want to just bring people in, you know, that have a lot of ailments and they can say, sue the government, look, I, I broke them, whatever. But I think it's more than, I think, unfortunately, it's just a, an old bureaucratic process and a staffing issue of, of process, right? If we don't innovate, if businesses don't innovate, they die. If government bureaucracies don't innovate, they, they grow, they continue. It's the opposite, you know? Um, and so, you know, and, and they're working on this. I'm not, I'm not attacking the military. I'm not attacking MEPS, MEPCOM, you know, uh, military interesting process and command. I'm not, I'm not saying that they do a terrible job. They're trying, but there's certainly more innovation that could be used, more effort and help that could be used specifically on that point of entry MEPCOM area because it's just an old process, it's bureaucratic. So when things have been done the same way for 80 years, we're just going to keep doing it the same way. But we're no longer in the World War II or Vietnam era, right? We're in a modern system where a a lot of this stuff could probably be done online much quicker and be like we should be cycling through in a much more efficient way you want to join amazon okay you can join amazon in a day you have a good interview you're there tomorrow and i keep using amazon and everyone can work from amazon i don't mean it like that but any fast food store any restaurant right? it's a much quicker process much simpler process so i'm not saying it shouldn't be as easy as that there are other things military lifestyle is not a business it's a much different uh, joining process, but we can innovate on this process in a lot of in a much better way. So the kid isn't waiting ninety days to show up to some you know quasi checkup room for a ten a ten minute exam. Frankly, it takes some ten hours because he's cycling through, and then he's like, "Okay, here's your papers. You got a waiver anyway." That, that that's a broken process, basically. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it makes complete sense. Is like, and I think that's the government's biggest issue sometimes, especially like I can only speak for obviously my time in and then the VA process outside of that. And it's just the inefficiencies and the uh, things that get, you know, slipped through the cracks. And it's like, there's gotta be a better way to do it. Somebody that's like you said, ran a business before that understands efficiency, understands uh, human psychology and the way, the way um, we need to be able to get things done quicker because it's one thing people are very, uh, they're very like they can they can create very well when they when there's money on the table right oh we're gonna make more money by making this switch right and so people don't think about that with the government and it's like well we got to protect our borders so like let's make this switch very efficiently so that way we can have more people that are willing to to have our back and be able to protect our country right because it's like that's the one thing about america is like we have that you know the, the most powerful military in the world and it's like you let that go and everything else is starting to slide downhill with it so um it's definitely a crisis like you talked about um real quick let's touch on like the uh the mental health because that's one thing that's just crazy to me is just the mental health across the nation with all and i don't know if it is just the social media if it is just the kind of um uh lack of delayed gratification where everything comes to you in an instant like can you talk about that a little bit absolutely uh without a doubt one of the biggest findings from all the reading and the studies is this is a much more anxious much more depressed much more mentally unhealthy generation like point blank like they're, they're every every study will, sh will show that um and it's, it's a it's a it's a mix of a few things right so the social media at birth has a huge effect. We were the first generation to truly have social media technology at birth. A lot of millennials had it at a very young age, maybe like, you know, middle school, high school, maybe a little bit earlier, but we are literally at birth. Like we are the first time ever where you could be getting, you know, a phone or computer skills, right? before you even hit kindergarten or when you're hitting kindergarten right so so and those development mental years are different so i do one of my biggest arguments is there is this this different generational break point somewhere in those years in the late 90s 2000s where like as a as a person growing up in the in the america like you then became the social media like generation right like you literally had that so so what is that doing what what is that actually impacting it does it does two things um one, it gives the trait, I think a lot of us are actually competitive now. So that, that's actually not the worst thing in the world. But if you are used to every post you make, every picture you take, to instantly be socially ranked, 
in a, in a direct feedback link system online, it makes you actually competitive, right? Hey, I posted a picture with this hat on and I got 10 likes, but John did one with, you know, that hat on and he got 20 likes. Like, like it creates this almost competitive, even if it's amongst friends, it creates an actual competitive drive. So that's one of the things I wanted to dispel. I actually, I'm like, with all respect to the millennials, a lot of millennials got the trope. The generation was, you're the, everyone gets a participation trophy generation. I actually don't think Gen Z is everyone gets a participation trophy. I think we understand fundamentally people, the world is competitive. People will compete. We don't expect a participation trophy. So that, that's a positive of our, of our mental psyche. But on the negative and going back to the, to the crisis, the mental health crisis that we have, that creates a lot of stress. And it creates a lot of mental health issues, right? Because everything you're doing is being judged. Everything is out there. Um, there's there, it's, it's social pressure to keep up, to compete, to, to sort of have this online persona and this in-person persona, right? Uh, it, it's become a very stressful mental health situation. And then with that, I just, you know, the three events that have punctuated our generation, just to explain sort of how we think, we are much more pragmatic. We've seen the world turn a little bit differently. By the 90s, very good times overall, very happy times, pretty much for the world and for the country, but for the world, not as much social strife domestically or, or internationally. So, so people are very optimistic, right? They're very global thinking, whatever. Um, again, not political in any way, but regardless of either side, the three events that have punctuated Gen Z's development, sort of early elementary school to like middle school, high school, college age is the great financial crisis, right? Which was a huge world sweeping economic event. The 2016 election, which doesn't matter what side you believe in, was a divisive election that we've seen domestic uh division, frankly, grow within our own country, right? And then the COVID pandemic, right? COVID, having COVID punctuate high school or middle school is a huge impact, right? It, it obviously impacted all of us in very different ways. But to have, you know, birthdays canceled, to have graduations canceled, things that every other year you would always expect sort of shook the generation in a, in a much more developmental way, right? Especially the younger ones that are, you know, those key years of school was super disruptive. I mean, no one can argue with that, right? Um, and so I think those things have given a much more pragmatic sense, more realistic sense to the generation with the impending uh, ramification being, you know, a more of a, a mental health stress. And that's something that we have to deal with. And the military, um, it's a poor rap, but maybe a rightfully so poor rap. A lot of so it hasn't been the greatest mental health haven in the past 20 years, right? I think it has made amazing strides and is working really hard in that area. Um, but a lot of veterans will say, no, their mental health was not taken care of or not considered or not cared for. And you're not going to attract a, a mentally health, a mentally ill generation or a, mental, a generation that cares a lot about mental health if you don't really both make changes and market the change as well, right? So if the perception is, hey, military doesn't give a blank blank about my mental health, then, you know, people that are concerned about that from their employer are not going to be in any way interested in, in moving or going, right? So, so I think that that's another problem that has to be discussed and uh, pushed, pushed heavily on, basically. Yeah, that's huge, man. Just like, so it's really obvious, like the mental health, crisis but you just putting all of that kind of into perspective with the presidential elections the financial crisis the things that even with covid the things that even the kids even your age and younger probably aren't really thinking about day to day but it like overall did make a huge impact on your everyday life so that and uh the technology from birth you know even i have a obviously i have young kids so i have a 12 year old a six-year-old and a three-year-old and even when the 12 year old, you know, back, back then, you know, they had iPads, but they aren't anything like they were now. Um, but I've watched the six year old and three year old essentially grow up with an iPad in their hand. Right. Not that we like every day you get iPad, like we're very like conscious of that, but when they do get it, I mean, it's super addictive. Um, they're kind of like my son, especially just kind of goes like, Hey, why are you could tell it's like, hitting a certain part in his brain that's just like releasing, you know, dopamine or whatever it is to where it's like, wow, this is, this is interesting. But so there's a negative aspects, but then there's also, I think some positive aspects too of like, I mean, this kid's essentially getting like a one-on-one -on -one tutor when he's, you know, learning all of this stuff that like, 
um you know just super i think there's like something to be said about kids that grow up like that and they they may um have more intelligence you know just because of the thing it's not you know it's not like they're sitting there just watching youtube videos. they're like actually learning things as well too but um i think that like you know mental aspect of it will be something that we're not even aware of like how much it's going to impact them good or bad in the future Absolutely. I think it's a super important point. And again, we, we know this from working out, right? How dopamine motivation drives our ability to, to lift in the gym and, and exercise, right? And these, you, you know, the te technology tools can be used for good or bad. And it, and it requires a lot of parental societal guidance when we've been given our children now these super powerful tools, right? That are instant dopamine releasers, right? Like they, they really can hit on those levels. And like you said, they can be used for good or for bad. And you have to be able to moderate that and guide America's youth through that, right? Because there's there's the good of, like you said, your son is going to have more access to more knowledge and will learn at a faster rate than any generation before. He's going to know a lot more than you and me at a much younger age. At the same time, as they grow and they age or as they're using that, right? We have to be very careful that it doesn't quickly shift to just scrolling through mindless videos that release a lot of dopamine in the head, but don't actually teach or don't actually be focused. And this is one of the big fears, right? So again, this is societal, societal point, not necessarily a military point, but it has a huge impact on the next generation of future warfighters, but also just future citizens of how they're thinking, how they're acting, like these shorter feedback cycles, these more global um, or just larger intelligence banks, they, they, they're going to know more than us, right? And this is one of the things that I argue successfully, or I argue in the book is like, hey, it is very possible the new E1, Z2s are just going to know more about topics than people way senior in the field. Experience still matters. I'm not taking anything away from that. Experience can guide and, 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 you know, move and protect and, and, and nurture and mentor. But we have a duty as, as we get older than to to use that newfound knowledge and intelligence in the military and guide it in the right way, right? Because they have more knowledge. We shouldn't be afraid of that. I think a lot of people are very afraid, like, oh, the E1 knows more than me, you know, hey, go, go run and do push-ups, you know, I don't, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want the, the master shouldn't be insulted by, by, by the young um, learner, you know, but like, I don't, I don't know about that. I think we should, we should guide that well. I think that's a, that's a key area for potential, so. Yeah, for sure. And at the end of the day, I mean, you still have rank. So even if these kids coming up are way better at technology or just do something better than you, like you got to use that as an asset. So I remember uh, a lot of that with the millennials. The millennials got a lot of hate. I haven't heard a lot about Gen Z, but I also ran a gym where we had like a lot of millennials when I was in my, you know, early 30s. And we'd have, you know, uh, 18, 20 year old kids coming in. And uh, one thing I noticed about them is like, you know, people, oh, they're lazy. They don't want to work. And it's like, really, they're just smarter. So they don't have to work as hard. They were, um, you know, they they were raised different than us. So they were able to comprehend things better. It wasn't just like work harder, work harder, work harder. It was like they have capabilities that we probably wish we had. So it's like, don't hate on the new generations because they had opportunities that we didn't have because that's literally like, half the reason we did it right so we can provide opportunities to other upcoming generations so they have to be approached differently and which is i think is kind of exactly what your 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 book is about and what everything we're talking about here is just that like you can't approach a gen z like even a millennial or, or a, you know gen x or boomer like they just have to be approached differently they're going to have different wants different needs um that type of thing Exactly. A hundred percent agree. hundred percent. Cool. So tell me like, cause we got a lot of veterans that listen to this. Um, how can us veterans that kind of did our time or maybe still doing our time, how can we help get Gen Z on par with what we need as far as recruitment and uh, protecting, protecting our country? It's a great question. And chapter four of the book is literally dedicated to that, right? It's a, it's the, the title of the chapter is enabling veterans to continue to serve. You, you guys are the key asset, frankly, if we're going to solve this, like, like you have, and you've done your time. So it's hard to say you have another duty, but you have a huge impact in the perception of this generation, right? Because like I said, at the beginning, we have fewer and fewer men and women in service. So 
anytime that a Gen Zer can see one, can talk to one, can have that continuous conversation, that's like the crucial way to continue to encourage people to serve. So one of my big theories, I had a brief presentation to the um, someone in the office of the Secretary of Defense that, that deals with this stuff. And it was, hey, the only way you're going to win on this, you, respectfully, you're not going to win via the recruiters. Like the recruiters do an extremely important job. They're super important, but you're not going to solve a crisis where the army is missing by 15,000 recruits just with recruiters alone like you're not just going to have more recruiters and solve the problem you're going to have to societally shift a few things you need the, the army of the masses basically of veterans of active um gen z military members combined with veterans to actually get the word out and so one of the the points i had there is hey listen everyone has to have a recruiter mindset if you work for a company for example right? You actually get recruiting bonuses. Like my old company, you would get a recruiting bonus and you'd all sort of know like, hey, to grow this company, we have an equity stake, you know, to grow this company, we, we need to bring people in. You want to bring people in. The military, we have this weird block. We say, oh, you know, we have no ability to bring, to determine who we bring in. We just show up to our unit and that the guy next to us is the guy that's going to be fighting for our life with us, you know? Whereas I think if we change the mindset that you can influence who comes in, you we do grow our own community, right? You, you have a lot of like your community members. You're sort of all united. That that, that brotherhood, sisterhood, and arms is all united together. You, you can actually have an impact and, and and bring people in, right? So, um, so so with that, like I think two things have to happen. Specifically, you have to be allowed to transparently tell your stories. I think the military is afraid that if you start suddenly a lot of veterans get up and start talking, like you'll tell the the good, the bad, the ugly. But that's what we want. Gen Z is pragmatic i want to know the, the terrible times the crap that you have to go through like the good the bad the ugly has to be allowed to be to be told right it has to be um honest and, and earnest it can't just be road painted pictures and rose gardens and you know the military is amazing everything's perfect there's a lot of negativity with it as with any organization or job and you have to be allowed to tell that story honestly I think an initiative that the, they should do, like they do at companies, are you know exit interviews and recordings. I think there should be huge databases of ideas from veterans about how to make the military better. Personal stories, like when you're when you're um, getting getting your DD paper, when you're actually leaving, like they should sit down in a formal recorded way. Again, it could be anonymized. It could be selected. Hey, I'm happy to put my name on this, whatever. But where you're you know, now we have NLP and AI, natural language processing and AI that can just cycle through all these things. So every, all the hundreds of thousands of people that are getting out, this should be some massive database online that the government is having, understanding, hey, these are ways that we can improve. These are, and it doesn't even have to be right when you're getting out. It could be, you know, yearly checks. So we have the data tools now to do that. But specifically, again, with recruiting, I personally would have never made it into the military had I not worked with amazing veterans like yourself and, and people are right? like I th they were in the company with me and so they were explaining the military life and that's ultimately that constant touch point is how I successfully joined and my belief my overarching thesis the way you solve this is by increasing those touch points increasing those connections having more veterans speak offering you know to speak to someone in your town one-on-one -on -one or in a group or whatever are key crucial um things because we all do care about the institution we care obviously about the country um, and we want to grow that. And I think the military as a whole, though, could do a better job of giving veterans a voice, of giving them a continued connection into the institution. It's sort of like you're gone. Well, you know, go, go, go and be fine. Like college alumni networks are much more, you know, conducive to staying connected. So I think there's a lot of areas in everything that I sort of said for veterans to play a key role, because um, you have a key role here, potentially the most important role, basically. Yeah, for sure. And that's huge. I mean, I love the way that you're explaining like how we fix this and it's essentially doing what like a big business would do, right? Because a big business whole job is to um, make more uh, business for themselves, right? And so like, if you look at it from a recruiting aspect, like that's the military's business is like, make more, right? The first and foremost thing is obviously protect the country, fight wars, but it's like, you need personnel to do that. So like, the referral process, like that's so that's so huge. Like it's just makes all the sense in the world. Like just have these guys, like if I'm in and my buddy wants to come in, be like, Oh yeah, I referred him. Cool. Here's an extra thousand bucks. Right. A lot of times they're going to get sign on bonuses or whatever you want to say anyway. So it's like, why not just take a little bit of that and give it to the guy that actually talked the buddy into getting in. Right. Um, another thing that like, as you're talking, I'm just thinking about all this stuff, like 
we have college athletes doing the NIL deals, right? Why couldn't a military personnel do that, right? Why couldn't you promote, uh, why couldn't you, hey, this person's in the Marine Corps and he's an infantry or maybe he's not infantry, maybe he's just like whatever on the back end, but he has real interesting stories he posts every day. You know, maybe he's promoting something like get people attached to that, especially the Gen Z, because they're seeing that they're like, shit, that life actually looks pretty good, right? Like everybody sees somebody else's life and they're like, that doesn't look that bad. And they do like today's society, they want to know about the good, the bad, and the ugly. You're hundred percent. Like the transparency is huge. Like transparency sells the people that do the best on social media and with their own personal brands are just like, yeah, I fucked it up today. Like this is what I'm doing. Yeah. That type of thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm a hundred percent on board with all that. And I think as veterans, um, we can definitely, you know, facilitate that as well too, because even if, if I'm a veteran, not that like I need anything for, Hey, Hey dude, you're 18. You should definitely look into this military thing. Like I did it. Here's the good, the bad, the ugly. But if you're going to give me like a thousand dollar kick bonus, just to like, Hey, yeah, my uncle told me to sign up, like write his name on the dotted line. And I get a thousand dollars in my account. I'd be like, yeah, I'll probably do that a lot more often than I would like if I wasn't getting that. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Exactly. No, absolutely. So hundred percent agree. I hope, hope your viewers feel uh, interested as well. Happy to answer any questions for a couple of minutes here and, and keep chatting because fascinating conversation. It's always, always great to be able to talk about these things. As I talk about them, I actually create more data points and ideas that I want to go write down and, and pass up. So this is, this is super helpful. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's see if we got any, um, any questions or anything anybody wanted to input and then, um, yeah, we can talk about your book a little bit more where people can pick that up and then, um, we'll just go from there. So we got, um, Janice, um, uh, Jerry is Perry asked, do you think social media has, um, ruined people's point of view and discouraging them from wanting to join? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I actually, we, we had this debate the other day, right? Because you see two sides of, of social media, of people in uniform now, right? And on the one side, like you're seeing what many veterans would say, like, is, is a denigration of the military. Right? You see like people doing dances in the uniform and all this kind of random nonsense that is not positive or conducive to, you know, to, to, to that, that, that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be. Good. At the same time, like I think the military is failing to recognize the power of social media and and regular people in uniform. So, for example, a few Marines. This is a perfect perfect example. Wanted to have this conversation with me, you know, because they're excited about the book. The officer wrote the book, whatever. They they wanted to talk about some of these chapters, right? And they wanted to be in uniform, just sitting around a table in the office talking about these chapters, right? And they were very worried that we would get in trouble because of the social media policy or the ability to, you know, talk in uniform about things. And, and this is where I have a problem with the way that the military uses or looks at social media. Like, I agree, we shouldn't be dancing and making ridiculous videos necessarily that make the uniform look bad. But we should humanize the uniform, especially for the public, so that, hey, if some really smart young Marine wants to ask, uh, you know, let's talk about one of these issues. We should be able to record that uniform just like anyone else, right? Just like people of the highest ranks go in these fancy think tanks and talk about this. We should be able to have, I should be able to have this very intellectual discussion right now in uniform, not saying this is the, the, the DOD's role, but I should be able to say, hey, I'm a regular Marine in uniform. Look at me. You can identify with me if you're an 18 year old, right? We look similar. We're talking similar. This is a conversation we can actually have Right. And and so I was pretty disappointed because uh, we don't have a simple answer. And, and the Marines were a little discouraged. They're like, sir, like, what, what, you know, everyone's running around doing these dances. We want to have a really intellectual conversation. We want to discuss things to make the force better, use the power of social media to spread that. But we don't know if we can. And so we're sort of trying to work through that. But that's a missed opportunity, frankly. Right. Like, how great would it be if Instagram, Facebook TikTok, was filled with smart, young military uh, members sharing their personal stories, talking about these issues, being encouraged to, right, to really, you know, saturate the social media universe. If, if things are going out on social media anyway, let's make them really positive, constructive, transparent views and conversations about the military, military life, showing what daily things are, educating the public. 
in a good way, right? Not, oh, you can't do that because it wasn't, you know, passed down from whatever. It doesn't mean, make sense to me. So that, that's an area that I've had a little bit of issue with, I guess, in the past. And that's a good question, yeah. Yeah, and I could see that being, from their point of view, being a security risk. So like some, you know, dumbass point, you know, post something that's like, you know, top secret or got some kind of clearance on it or something. Um, so, but that doesn't make it not possible right it's just the navigation of like those specific topics right and so i would love to see military influencers you know there's a quite a few veteran influencers that i watch that serve their time and you know there's rappers there's people with supplement lines that type of thing so that's really cool to see but what about if you're in the military and you have a link to like hey link in my bio if you want to talk to a recruiter right and then with a military personnel who's an influencer, they get a kickback if that person, you know, whoever hits that link ends up signing up or, you know, scheduling a call with the recruiter or something like that. Exactly. No, 100%. It's just it's a brilliant idea. I agree with that. Cool. A um, couple other comments here. So a couple of people just saying hi and replay. And then we have Janice said, uh, trust is an issue. Um, Big time. I love, love the military because my daddy and my husband served, but let's see here. Uh, but I watched the VA try to pull off horrendous shoddy medical treatment for my husband for years. I'm afraid to talk about it because I depend on the VA for benefits. And that is all the tab taboo subject. Um, military sexual assault. Uh, so we are Vanessa Gillian. I don't know. Did you ever watch that, Matt? Um, yeah, absolutely. Are... Absolutely. Watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Vanessa yeah. Gillian, that was yeah. a, that was a very interesting um and yeah i can see that too because even with uh pat uh pat tillman kind of the cover-up of that whole situation i don't know if you ever did you even know who pat tillman was absolutely yeah pat tillman uh arizona cardinal potential drafty yep and then yeah and he was basically yep. uh killed by friendlies and then they covered it up yep. and tried to you know and I understand why they did that, but it's also like, yeah, they got, you know, the military needs to fess up to just not being perfect. Um, obviously, no one is, no organization is. Um, the Vanessa Gillian thing is uh, another kind of example of that. Um, but yeah, she just basically says like, yeah, the um, the trust factor is a big is a big thing with that too, especially like now nowadays everything can be documented, so you can see a. You could see a documentary on specific cases and stuff. So, hundred percent trust, trust being huge, um, and, and open and honest. And one of the chapters specifically, right? The biggest pool to pull for from in terms of currently not currently in the workforce, but not in the military force, is is females in uniform, right? That's a huge growing growth pool that the military needs to make a comfortable and okay environment for. And and at the same time, you know, and this is one of my points in the book. The military needs to recognize that there's a difference between recruiting um, for the majority female aspect and the majority male aspect. Meaning, you know, you look at the data. There, there are many jobs that females will outperform men in, right? They're, they're going to college at a higher degree than men now. They're, they're succeeding in that. But at the same time, I, I'll use my sister as an example, right? She'd be great in certain military jobs. She has no desire to go put on a ruck and become an infantryman. That's just not her her. Uh, route. And I think a lot of females would agree. I think a lot of people have agreed with this point that, you know, always focusing on like the five females that made special forces or, you know, the, the, the small amount that are in specific infantry roles, it denigrates from the majority of females who are doing an unbelievable job in some of these other roles um, that should be supported and recruited for and to, you know, and so we sort of focus on like the extreme, the hyper when we should be Females will be potentially the saving force for the military, females in uniform, but they, we, we can't just assume or we can't just focus on, okay, females in uniform, uh, females in infantry, females in special ops, like that's not going to appeal to the average American female, right, versus sort of the average American female showing all the many jobs that they can have a huge impact in, can have a huge support in. So that's one of the major marketing points. We shouldn't be so obsessed with, you know, again, amazing women, total respect to them, not, not saying anything against them, but the majority, you shouldn't be marketing infantry and, and special ops too, because that's not what the majority is going to go. We have to be realistic in these things, even if it's a little bit painful, I hope not controversial, but maybe it is, but a little bit painful to have, we have to be able to have that discussion, like to my sister's, don't show her special ops and infantrymen because that's not what she wants to do. 
show her some of the other amazing jobs and aspects that she can make a huge impact while serving her country in. It's a point there. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think the the marketing you you nailed it on the head is just like marketing the right way to the right demographic, which is another thing that big businesses do too, right? It's not like they just if they have different demographics and they're marketing different ways to each each individual or each group, right? They're not just like spray and pray, like hope everybody wants to join the infantry or hope everybody wants this uh, this loofah from the shop, you know, like that type of thing. Like everybody's going to have a different um, marketing approach. Exactly. Cool, Matt. Um, so where can people pick up your book if they want to take a read and uh, order it? Absolutely. And I'll, I'll send you a link right now, but uh, basically it's only sold on Amazon. So there's a link to the website, um, which is www.unclesambook.org. Now I'll, I'll shoot you over. And then just the Amazon um, account is, is where the book is being sold. So just, we don't want you uncle Sam. That is the Amazon uh, page. It's a uh, bestseller right now in the category, which is exciting um nice. we don't want you on sam examining the military recruiting crisis it's definitely growing in, in topic I, you know publishing a few newspapers and a few news interviews people are interested uh my goal i'm not making any money on the book my goal is just to simply have this conversation as many times as possible because i believe if we all have these conversations like you brought some great ideas to me today like we can crowdsource these ideas on a much better level we can fix our force in a positive way and we 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 should be having this conversation right you know every outlet and every you know problem deserves airtime but this is a key one that i think everyone has a super valid impactful viewpoint right i want every e2 and e1 to be thinking hey how can i make this force better how can i make my friend in high school who didn't join uh, more likely to join every veteran thinking hey you know I, I know my time i know my things how can we make um this better and i think that that's that's really my mission here uh, it's been an exciting ride just because there's been a lot of positive feedback but that's really my goal and so we'll see that hopefully continue to grow. Yeah. And uh, it's pretty obvious, man. But why don't you tell everybody like why, why that's important? I think, you know, I put this right in the beginning, right? A, we are at a super, super big inflection point with the all volunteer force, right? Like it's been a 50 year experiment that's gone well overall, but it will not continue. The army missing a division and 15,000 recruits like that is at a breaking point of we will start to have to reduce our force posture and our capability if we if we continue to have multiple bad years of recruiting, right? which is pretty scary, right? Like if we don't hit numbers, sure, one year, two years is fine. But if, if this trend continues, we will have to reduce our numbers and, and actually reduce our commitments. And then the other scary point, and I think this is the larger ethereal point to the country, is like, hey, we don't know how many people we're going to need in a potential world conflict or world crisis, right? Like these are just estimations and numbers. The scarier point is that we have our generation or our country, we don't have people willing or wanting to serve. That's, that's the bigger point. What are we fighting for? Is, is the country worth fighting for? That's the larger question that you're getting at, right? If you continually don't have interest, we sort of Freedom is not free. I mean, we lose our, our root connection to that. And that's the scary point. Like these are just manpower predictions, right? They're best guess estimates of what we need to sustain certain force levels. Obviously, in a war, we probably need to surge. Are we gonna have a war and no one's gonna come and fight? Like what's gonna happen? So that's a super larger macro thing of why this matters. I believe it's a super important issue. For sure. Yeah, I couldn't send any better, man. Um, you definitely have a passion for this man, and it's uh amazing to see that you know you're you're kind of pushing this march forward so i'm i'm all on board for it anything i can do to help um anything my um my listeners can do to help you know we will and uh yeah keep in touch because i definitely want to like kind of see your journey man so um is there like an instagram or anything where we can watch the journey at or anything like so, that yes i actually the joke is like my own social media for this is, is limited i've been relying on all these other influencers to post uh on the website has all the news links uncle sam book is like a like an instagram is is the official instagram if people want to check it out at, at uncle sam book um but yeah hopefully we'll just keep growing and continue to have amazing talks like this so thank you so much for this i really appreciate it
Yeah, man. Let's get you an Instagram or a TikTok or something. You can't be Gen Z and not have a no. Uh, social I, I media, have but... yeah. I don't go Sam Book. I don't go Sam Book. <laughs> exactly. I got you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> All right. Cool, man. Well, I appreciate your time tonight, and uh, yeah, we will be uh, keeping in touch and just watching the journey, man. Awesome. All right. You have a great day. You too, brother. Appreciate you. Bye.